The good news according to St. Mark, the seventh chapter. Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenic- of, of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by way of Sidon toward the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. They brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hand on on him. He took him aside in private away from the crowd and put his fingers into his ear, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be open. And immediately his ears were open, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one. But the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. The good news of the Lord. Please be seated. Now, you're going to have to be patient with me this evening. Um, My allergies are doing, have been like insane all day long. Woke up this morning and hadn't been up 10 minutes and was like sneezing these loud. And I sneeze these real booming loud sneezes. I was so glad Carla was awake also because there is no way she could have slept through that if if I hadn't. So... I do know it's allergies, and not, not that I'm getting sick, um, all right, so don't, don't worry about me getting, being, catching something from me, it's just allergies. All right, this, this, this afternoon, we're going to look at our gospel text, um, and I'm going to probably take you out someplace y'all didn't really want to go with it, uh, but that's all right. It's, it's where the Holy Spirit is leading. It's also where our church is leading, and, um, as in the ELCA, and we'll get to that uh, in, a, in just a moment. All right, let's be honest. We all want to be included. We want people to call us and let us know what's going on. Even if we can't make it, the fact that somebody calls and lets you know is good enough. We don't like to be on the outside looking in. We always want to be at the party. We want to be a part of the happenings and going-ons. Sometimes, however, we're not invited to the party. We don't make the cut or we're not part of the the in crowd. Maybe we don't have the certain job uh, or, or know the right people. Maybe we don't have the education or status to get an invitation. Maybe we don't attend the right social functions or belong to the right club. Maybe we don't live in the right neighborhood or subdivision. Or maybe it's because of skin color that we're left out of the party. In a country that prides itself on liberty and justice for all, there are still a lot of of people who are left out of the party. And sometimes they're kicked out. Single mothers who are struggling to make ends meet, working two and sometimes three jobs, leaving them quality time with their, ch- leaving little quality time with their children are left out of the party. Children whose faces we don't see or, 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 or neglect to see as they go to bed hungry every night are left out of the party. Abused women with no place to go and nowhere to turn are left out of the party. Black men who have their manhood snatched away by governmental institutions that are supposed to be in the business of rehabilitating people for society are left out of the party. 
our elders who have to decide whether to, fu- to fill their prescriptions or pay the light bill this month are left out of the party. The people who are tucked neatly away in assisted living facilities and the family and the church have thrown away the key to their hearts are left out of the party. People trapped in the neighborhood, overrun by crime, filth, and decay are left out of the party. Children having to go to dysfunctional schools where the powers that be don't seem to care are left out of the party. Well, I'm here to remind somebody that God has a party and we're all invited. So if you ever felt like you've been locked out, kicked out, thrown out, or knocked out, I got good news for you. God will pick you up, turn you around, and place your feet on solid ground. God doesn't care who you are. God wants all people to be saved. God has all power. God will bring us out and bring us through. And thanks to Jesus, we have access to God. We're all welcome to come to the party. The problem is is that sometimes you feel that you're not invited to the party. You're not invited to the banquet. Sometimes you feel as if you're not qualified. Sometimes you're left out of the party. And for some, they're systematically left out of the party. That's what happens in our gospel text. Uh, We have two different situations, one involving a woman and the other involving a group of people. In both situations, the people need some, needed something, but due to the, the racism of the time, they weren't really invited to the party. Okay, I bet I shocked some of you. You never thought about this story about, be, about be, being about getting beyond your racism. This is what happened after Jesus had entered Gentile country. Okay, he's in Gentile country. Jesus is Jewish. He's in Gentile country. After preaching a serious discourse of what the, what the meaning of clean and unclean is, uh, after telling the religious leaders of his day th- uh, that what goes into a person doesn't make the person unclean, but what comes out makes that person unclean, Jesus now heads for unclean Gentile country to get some rest. See, he didn't have to worry about the religious leaders following him. They'd never go to that side of the tracks. Even his disciples had to be wondering, Jesus, uh, what are you doing going here? These folks don't look like us. Shouldn't we be preaching to our own people? These Gentiles weren't invited to the party. As far as Jewish theology was concerned, they weren't fit to receive God's love. They weren't Jews. So no one considered them important. They were locked out of the church. Israel was to be a light to the Gentile, but many Jewish leaders used their status as God's chosen people to condemn others. Sisters and brothers, we have to be careful about locking folks out of the church. Our presiding bishop has called us to talk about racism because as a 97% white denomination, we have been stained by the residue of selective inclusion. We have to work harder at telling a dying humanity that Jesus died for all of us and all are welcome. We have to work harder at telling people that Jesus is the Savior for all humankind. We have to work harder at telling the people that Jesus lives and breathes right here at Holy Trinity Lutheran Church. The prevailing thought, the leading theology for Jewish society in Jesus' day was that people who didn't fit in, who didn't have the right status or the right position, didn't get to come to the party. Don't come crying. Gentile lives matter. God's not going to do anything for you. Matter of fact, you're in the condition that you're in because of the choices you made. So God hasn't looked favorably on you. It's a sad thing when church theology keeps anyone out of the party. It's even a sadder thing when we keep ourselves out of the party. We do that when we feel we're unworthy or not good enough. We keep ourselves out of the party when we harbor resentment for past sins, letting them torture us like a never-ending fire, and also when we refuse to acknowledge our sins. We, we, We keep ourselves out of the party when we think God will never forgive me because I can't forgive myself, and also when we think I don't do anything wrong that I need to ask forgiveness for. We keep ourselves out of the party until we wake up one day and we're tired of living like we've lived. We're tired of not being fully alive. We're tired of dodging our enemies and worrying about our friends. We we get tired of living beneath our standards. We get sick and tired of being sick and tired. So we want back in the church. We want back into God's party. 
We want our purpose and meaning back into our lives. We want to live again. We want to be blessed and to be a blessing to others. So we turn to Jesus, not knowing really what to expect. We just turn to Jesus. We heard that Jesus has come into so many lives and, tort- and, and turned them around before, casting out demons and healing the sick. Maybe, just maybe, he can do this for me. Can you heal me, Jesus? Can you save me, Jesus? Am I welcome to your party, Jesus? The woman's daughter was possessed by a demon. She'd probably been to every doctor and specialist in the region. The woman heard that Jesus was coming to town. She had to see him. She had to ask. She had to see for herself what this Jesus guy was all about. But she was a woman. Women weren't supposed to talk to men they didn't know. Plus, in Jesus' day, women had no rights. They weren't even allowed in worship services. Not only that, she was a Gentile. Gentiles weren't supposed to talk to Jews. And and to top it all off, she was Syrophoenician. To put it in modern terms, she was Lebanese. As far as Jewish folks were concerned, that meant she was the lowest of the low. She wanted to go up to Jesus and ask for a blessing. She wanted to ask for healing for her daughter. She had some nerve going up to the Lord of hosts and asking him for an invitation to the party. People were surely going to talk about her. But that didn't stop the woman. She ran up to to Jesus, laid down at his feet, and asked for help. She was probably thinking, I I know this isn't protocol. I know I shouldn't be doing this. I know that people will think I'm crazy, but I've tried everything that I know. And Lord, I need you right now. I don't care what might happen. Lord, I need help, and I need it right now. Jesus tries to get rid of her by calling her a female dog. I know that's hard for some of you to hear. You're used to Matthew's account, which softens the story. You look at Jesus with eyes 2,000 years removed and from the other side of the world. In other words, we can't project our 21st century Western view of Jesus on Mark's 1st century Middle Eastern telling. There are two things you need to keep in mind with this telling. First, for Mark, Jesus didn't become the Christ until the resurrection. Mark shows that Jesus struggled with walking in step with God, taking him to the garden where he asked that he not continue on the path. Second, because Jesus isn't the Christ yet, Mark doesn't portray Jesus in a warm and fuzzy, Jesus loves me, what a friend we have in Jesus' way. Jesus gets frustrated, annoyed, and angry in Mark's gospel and shows it. So Jesus tried to throw her off and called her literally a little bee. She turns it around on him and says, even a little bee like me eats the crumbs from the master's table. In other words, Jesus, I I know your mission. I know what you were sent to do. I know that you are here for your people. But right now, Lord, my child is sick and needs healing. I don't care what you do, Lord. Don't care how you do it. Don't care anything about your mission. All I know is that my child is in need of a miracle. And I'll take the crumbs in order for it to get done. She wasn't about to let her pride or Jesus' prejudice limit God's grace. Our pride and prejudice threaten to limit us from God's grace as well. When we take offense at this story, it reveals more about us than it does about Jesus. It reveals that we often create a nice nice guy, Jesus, who waits upon our next urgent request. If we ask nicely, then Jesus has to do it. We are not all that different from my children. There's always been a little bit of sibling tension between Maya and Evan, my two youngest. We had to teach them to ask nicely when we questing something from the other. Not just, give it to me, give it, you know, but ask nicely. When Evan asked Maya to, for something she had and she said no, he got mad and, was, and, and said, but I asked nicely. When we approach Jesus, we often do so with our pride leading the way. We come with brazen confidence that our nice guy, Jesus, is like a genie in a bottle. You know, just rub it and make your three wishes, and he's obliged to do your service. Uh, We don't want to come before Jesus as we truly are. We don't want to be vulnerable or risk criticism or a cutting remark he may have for us. This story reveals our prejudices also. We have no problem with 
Jesus letting people have it that we think deserve it. I've never heard anyone ever try to justify Jesus calling the Pharisees a brood of vipers. The Jewish disciples that were with him probably enjoyed it when Jesus called her a dog and they were the children of God. Because we're Gentiles also, we identify with this desperate woman and don't like Jesus' response. But we don't mind if he sticks it to those Pharisees. We just don't want him to stick it to anyone who might be remotely like us. We don't believe there's enough to go around for everybody, so we want our crumbs and everybody else is on their own. But I have some good news today. You don't have to worry about fighting over the crumbs. Jesus is providing a full meal. Welcome to the party. Because of what the woman said, she was given the whole enchilada. I really wonder where that phrase came, comes from, but I love that one. Um, you can come to Jesus just as you are. You don't have to be a crumb snatcher. By bowing down, the woman stood up and opened the door for all of humanity. Don't settle for the crumbs. That's part of the reason Bishop Eaton, that's, she's the presiding bishop of the ELCA, issued a call to action for ELCA pastors and congregation to participate this weekend in confession, repentance, and commitment to end racism. We've been settling for the crumbs. What are the crumbs? I'm so glad you asked. asked. Well, black and Latinos aren't being lynched anymore, so racism must be over. Blacks and Latinos can live wherever they want. So racism must be over. We elected a black president. We've got a Latino running for president. And, and Jeb Bush is married to a Latina. So racism must be over. Well, I'm not racist. I've got black and Latino friends. So racism must be over. Those are all crumbs. Sure, things are a lot better for people of color than they were 100 years ago. As research and studies have shown, though, racism still exists in this country. It's just become more subtle. We need to stop settling for the crumbs. Our faith teaches us that we can go boldly to the throne of grace just as we are, with all our pride and prejudice, and ask the one who gives us strength to help us in our time of need. But Jesus doesn't stop there. Being opened by the woman, Jesus continues to open things up. He goes on into another Gentile territory and sees a group of people with a man who was deaf and has a speech impediment. He could talk, but probably not clearly. The people who were, all, who were probably all Gentiles because he's still in a Gentile territory brought him to Jesus for a healing. And too often people who don't think they fit in the church become deaf, deaf to the word and cannot speak. They remain outside, unable to come to the house of the Lord, or for that matter, speak with, the, with Jesus themselves. They need a little help. They need a little guidance. That, sisters and brothers, is where the church comes in. We need to be the lighthouse for the world. We need to place, be the place where people who have lost their speech and their hearing of the word can come and be welcomed. We're called to help lead people to Jesus and away from the racist, sexist, homophobic world they inhabit. I'm not talking about waking, walking up to people and asking them, do you know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? Savior, people don't need that. People need to see our good works. People need to see who and whose we are. People need to be able to count on the church. Many of our children are stammering over their speech and can't hear any of our teachings. Many of our women are living beneath their means, living lives that they don't have to live. Many of our men are struggling with their speech impediment by not living at all. Many of our families are stammering over what's right and what's wrong. Many of our institutions we have trusted in the past are deaf to the concerns of the people they should be protecting. Many of our politicians are deaf and mute to the concerns of their constituents. And many of our churches are stammering over their words and deaf to the needs of the community. But if we are to be the church that Christ has built, we need to lead these folks to Jesus. Before he heals the man, Jesus looks up to heaven and sighed. Now, maybe he was sighing over the fact that the otherwise healthy man had been burdened by this affliction for a long time. But whatever the reason, he yelled out, Ephephatha, I can never get that word right twice in the sermon, be open and be set free. 
And that's what our call is, to be open and help set free. Be open to the crumb snatchers of the world. There are people out there that are willing to take their blessings in crumbs, but Jesus has promised a whole meal. Sometimes we have to sigh along with Jesus with all of the problems we will have to face, but our mandate is simple. Go to the uttermost places and make disciples. Go into places where the people look nothing like us. Go into places where the people are just living off the crumb blessings and, telling, and tell them that they too have abundant life. Go Go to the places where people don't expect to be blessed. Go to the places where folks think that God has deserted them. Go to the place where folks have lost all hope. Go to the place where time seems to stand still and there's no improvement anywhere. Go to the places where gangs and thug life is present. Go to the places where we wouldn't, wouldn't normally go. Go to the places where we can be a light in the midst of darkness by doing the work of Christ, helping to heal, deliver, and set free some folks folks who thought that they weren't invited to the party by being open to the people who are willing to settle for Jesus crumbs by being open to people who need help understanding that they have a reservation for the eschatological banquet that we all will be invited to one day by being open to the crumb snatchers we remember that we were once crumb snatchers as well we remember that we too wanted to live off the crumbs. We remember that we didn't feel worthy. We, re remem we remember that we didn't feel qualified, dignified, verified, or justified. We remember that we didn't care about edifying, glorifying, magnifying, or testifying God's name at all. By being open to the crumb snatchers, we realized that it wasn't too long ago we felt that way. It wasn't too long ago that we didn't love. It wasn't too long ago that we didn't care. It wasn't too long ago that we couldn't speak. It wasn't too long ago that we couldn't hear. It wasn't too long ago that we were just wandering around with nothing to say. After hearing the woman's words, Jesus tells his disciples and is trying to tell us today that everybody is welcome to the party. No one is left out of the party. No matter who you are, where you come from, what school you went to or go to, what degree you hold, what part of town you live in, what your past may be, who your parents are or the color of your skin, you're all welcome to the party. Because when you come to Jesus, when you come to the party, when you are truly set free, you realize that no one can stop you from receiving a blessing. You realize that now you can speak and hear with some clarity. And because of all of that, you realize that you need to be a blessing to others. You need to hear the cries of black and brown people in this country. You need to hear the pleas of Syrians who just want a place to live in peace. You need to hear the cry of Rohingyans who, who want to escape religious persecution in Miramar. And then you can speak out. You can open your mouth and speak out for them as well. You can speak out and you can do this with confidence because you can sing with conviction. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Amen. <laughs>